Well, good morning. My name is John Bourgeois, and I'm one of the pastors here. A very warm welcome to you this morning. And we have the great privilege this morning of uh, from hearing from uh, Rico Tice. I want to invite Rico up. Rico is a minister, and he has... Uh, is also the co-founder of Christianity Explored, which is a ministry that we have benefited from greatly as a church. And and here are his assistants, Chuck and Lorianne, and um, and Rico's props. Get ready; it's gonna be great. Go ahead, assistants. Um, and uh, excited that we're gonna get a chance to hear from Rico this morning. Um, so, Rico, I'm gonna interview, ask you a couple questions, so that we can get to know you. Um, so, Rico, uh, when we hear the name Rico. Here, you need to know, Rico's from England, but when we hear it here, we think of Rico Suave. So how did, yeah. how did a Brit get the name Rico? Yes, just to say it's a stupid name. It's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. <laughs> so I was born in Chile in South America. I'm England, English by background, but my dad was growing tobacco in Chile, and I was christened Richard, which is Ricardo in Spanish, so it's shortened to Rico. And by the way, it is Rico Tice, not Tico Rice. I spent my life being called Tico Rice, which sounds like number 42 at the takeaway, doesn't it? So it's Rico Tice. <laughs> Yeah. At school, I was known as Rico Strico, which had nothing to do with my behavior. I was very modest. But anyway, there we are. Yeah. <laughs> and how did you come to faith, Rico? Um, yeah, I don't come from a Christian home. My parents were lovely, but not a Christian home. A sort of formal um, Episcopalianism, if you like, but not Christian. We never prayed, never read the Bible. But then when I was 16, my godfather was killed in a cliff fall. And um, uh, um, no one in the family had any answers to his death. He was my dad's older brother. And a maths teacher at my school wonderfully said to me, when Jesus got through death, he got through death to get you through. And I remember thinking, if that's true, it's the most important thing in the world. And then, as is classic with the Episcopalian church, I found that we had a school chaplain who didn't believe it. He actually didn't believe the gospel, even though he was uh, meant to be in charge of the religious stuff. And um, actually, that, I think that got me into ordained ministry in some ways. I was so cross to have someone in charge who wasn't telling the truth. But that sort of pushed me into ministry a bit, I think. And would you tell us about your family? Yes, I'm married to Lucy, and uh, I've got um, three kids. Um, I, I got through puberty at 38, so I got married at 42, and my kids are now 7, 10, and 12, so I'm just exhausted. And we've got, um, we're, we're just moving, but where, where we've lived at the moment, we've got Peter and Daniel at uh, 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 10 and 12, and then a little girl, Mercy, 7, so it's a stupid thing to call your youngest Mercy with two older brothers, because I spent my life going, Mercy, where's Mercy? Leave Mercy alone. And she's, for five years, slept under the stairs. Central London so congested that in our flat, it's so small, she slept, she's like Harry Potter. She slept under the stairs. That's been her bedroom. So she'll be screwed up later in life and do pray for her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah. tell us about your work. And what you're doing now. Yeah, I work with Lorianne. Lorianne is um, uh, Chuck's wife, is wonderfully CEO for Christianity Explored over here. And our great passion is to get people to look at Mark's gospel and ask any question they like. And uh, we found that that really is being picked up by churches. There are 70 different translations, about 140 countries that's in about. Chuck Colson Prison Fellowship have picked it up, and about half a million prisoners have done that. So we're just thrilled. But it's just very simple. We're saying, here's Mark's gospel. Actually, there are only three words you need to go through Mark's gospel. You could sort of take some highlighters and go through it and color it in. So it's so simple to teach. And, and really, that's what uh, Lorianne and I are giving our lives to, to try to help people do that. And there'll be a session here on Thursday for that. Yes. And Rico, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to pray for Rico in the preaching of the word. So please pray with me. Father, uh, we give you great thanks for this, your servant, Rico, and we thank you that he is here to preach to us the gospel of your son, Jesus. Lord, we come to you now, and Lord, ask that you would speak to us by your spirit and your word, that you would receive the glory in your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Do you know what? I was so absorbed by that lovely baptism, I didn't get any of my stuff ready. So it's not my fault, it's Scotty's fault. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> Let's, um, uh, if you've got a Bible, I wonder if you could turn to it. Let's have a look at Romans chapter 1. So here is uh, the Apostle Paul. And uh, brothers and sisters, he is writing to Rome. And he's saying, please help me as I push on in my mission to Spain. I want to take the gospel west. And as he does that, he articulates the gospel and tells us why it's so important. And I want to start reading at verse 14 of chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. So Paul writes, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then to the Gentile. 
For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And then Paul explains why it's such a battle to get the gospel out. He says this is the human reaction to it. So verse 18, brothers and sisters. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their foolish uh, thinking, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual morality for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Let me pray. Oh, Father God, we do pray that you would speak to us very deeply this morning in your word. We dare to pray, Father, that actually what we learn today would stay with us all our days and would be for the glory of God and the great benefit of others. Amen. Well, as we begin this morning, and thank you so much for coming, um, I wonder if you could just give yourselves this question. It's coming up on the board. What stops us telling others? about the Christian faith. So I wonder if you can turn to the person next to you and just say, look, what is it that stops us? Why, why won't we speak of Jesus? It may be that you don't want to answer that, so just turn to the person next to you and say, I don't like people, I'm not talking to you. It's fine. <laughs> okay, are we off? What stops us? Got a, a minute just to chat about that. That'd be great. Great. Okay, now don't leave the, uh, the fat English Episcopalian struggling at the front here. Someone shout out. Anyone, what is it that stops us? Anyone got a thought on that? Fear of being called a hypocrite. Gosh, that's a good one, isn't it? Do you know, my father was very upset when I said I wanted to go into ministry. And he said to me, um, this is when I was 21, he said, he said, I had friends that on business trips went from the brothel to mass he said, I didn't go to the brothel with them. I didn't go to church with them either. I do not know why you're getting involved with these people. That's what my father's view of getting ordained was. Hypocrisy is a desperate thing. So in the light of hypocrisy, what have we got to do? Brothers and sisters, we've got to be those who acknowledge our wrongdoing. And if we get it wrong, we've got to say it. Fear of being called a hypocrite. Yeah, let's try and live it. Don't give people a reason to reject 1 Peter 2. That's a very good line. What else stops us? What else stops us doing it? Sorry, ma'am? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. And just unpick that a little bit more on uncomfortable. How it just, it, there's just a feeling of, yeah. 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 I, I think that is right. Afraid that, that we might insult or call them out. Just to say, when I'm talking to something, some, quite often I'll say to people before I say something, I'll say, this friendship's important to me. You're important to me. As I say this now, I, 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 you know, I, I, I hope you'll feel that I, you, you're really precious. But at the same time, can I say, we all struggle with speaking to people. We all don't have a butterfly but an eagle in our stomach. And there is a fear as we speak. And I just want to begin by saying, it's right there's a fear that we speak as we speak to other people. Brothers and sisters, let me be honest with that. Jesus said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. So, so um, we are going to get hurt. We are going to get rejected. Because he says to us, Jesus, he warns, they hated me and they'll hate you. So if you're feeling worried about that, I, that that's, that's appropriate. And therefore, the first word we've got to get in place, brothers and sisters, is this, as we start the, the, this sermon, is identity. 
in my identity, I've got to make sure I'm secure in the grace of God so that maybe if you're taking notes, jot this down. Whether someone accepts or rejects me doesn't make me valuable. What makes me valuable is the gospel. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that in place. Let's just try anything else. We'll just, just as we get one or two other thoughts as we go to it. Um, Josh, what about you? Anything? What stops us speaking? Where's Josh? Brother, there you are. I've had a word of knowledge, and that's his name. So there we are. What, what is it that stops us, Josh? Yeah, gosh, it's bringing it to, it's, absolutely. How do, I, how, do I, how do I make sure that I have in place? You know, it's a question quite often, again, I come from a non-Christian home, but to ask yourself the question, where will this person be in 100 years' time? Where will they be? And therefore, the success or failure of any life is what I do with Jesus. That's the success, or, because ultimately, by his resurrection, he stands at the head of history. And do and, and, and you know what failure is? Let me give you a definition of failure. Failure is being successful at the things that don't matter. Failure is being successful at the things... Do you know, a granny said that to me at the funeral of a young mum who died at a, in a car crash. What really matters is, is what I do for Christ. Um, brilliant. Let's have a look down and see what the motivation is here as we come down to the passage brothers and sisters, can we have a look down? How do I get my identity in the grace of God as we start? Because I'm not going to speak unless I'm secure. So whether you accept or reject me, I'm, I'm, I'm valuable. Not your opinion of me. Although I care for you massively, it's not your opinion that matters. Have a look down and see what we're told in terms of getting grace in place. I wonder if we can stick up the slide on grace. And look down, please, at verse 17. Now, Romans 1.17 is one of the most important verses in church history. In 1505, Martin Luther said, I hated God. I hated God because he demanded a righteousness from me, and all I saw in my own heart was wickedness. And then he famously had his tower experience when reading Augustine's commentary on Romans, he suddenly realized, brothers and sisters, the essence of the Christian life is not a righteousness I give to God. Oh, that's so classically English. That's my family. I'm a good person. God looks at me. No, it's not a righteousness good I, uh, I give to God. The essence of the Christian life is a righteousness I receive. Jesus gives me his righteousness. So do we see it as we look down? For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness is by faith from first to last, not by works. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Um, this is a, a diary of my life. Rico Tice, The Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. I wonder if you can see here, as, as you look at it, this is everything I've ever done wrong in this book, and can you see every page is blank? Why is every page blank? Because amazingly in the gospel, I have been given the righteousness of Christ. So Luther said, how can we be simulistra set peccator, at the same time sinners and justified? So God sees my sin, and yet amazingly, he gives me the gift of Christ's righteous life. Gresham Machen, the great Westminster theologian, as he was dying, his last words were, I thank God for the righteousness of Jesus, for the obedience of Jesus, because he knew as he stood before God, God would declare him righteous because he was related to God through Christ's performance, not his own. So what does that mean when it comes to evangelism? It means as I'm speaking to someone, I don't live for their approval, but from it. I got sent to an English boarding school when I was eight. I've just about recovered now. I'm just about through the experience. <laughs> so I went for 10 years. And when I got to that boarding school, I was taught three things. Number one, Tice, you are not good enough. You're not good enough, Tice. Secondly, prove yourself. And thirdly, it's a dangerous world. I knew it was a dangerous world. The prefect in my dorm got into bed with the prefect in the other dorm each night. So there I was. Can you imagine what happened when I was told the gospel by that maths teacher when I was 16? And I suddenly, you're not good enough. No, I'm not, but I've been given the righteousness of Jesus. Oh, the utter relief of it. Secondly, prove yourself, no, I, I live by his performance, not mine. It's a dangerous world, yes, but he will get me through. So can I ask you today, where are you with the righteousness of God and the wonder of grace as it's been given to you? This is what um, uh, Martin Luther, in his book, The Freedom of a Christian, he was, he was trying to describe in that book the wonder of grace. I'll put it in modern terms. He said, imagine this. 
Imagine back in 2010, Prince William comes out of St. James's Palace, and he walks up Haymarket in London, and then he, he turns uh, uh, right, and he goes along Shaftesbury Avenue, and he goes left into Soho. And he walks into Soho, and there is a woman in Soho, and she has needle marks up and down her arms. She is drunk. There's a smell of sick. Uh, there are clients around that have used her. The language is terrible. There's no question that she's a prostitute. And imagine Prince William, 2010, walks up to her, and he takes her by the hand, and he says to her, I want you to come with me right now. And much to the chagrin of Kate Middleton, he says, I'm going to marry you in Westminster Abbey. And then William says, and now I want you to come home with me and spend your life with me in St. James's Palace. Now, that is what God has done for you in the gospel. Amidst all your sin and depravity, he has declared you righteous and he has adopted you. Brother, sister, what does that do for you? This is what um, uh, 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 Alf Stanway, uh, an Australian bishop, said to some men in Pittsburgh getting ordained in the 1950s. He said this, and it's, it's so striking, really, in terms of what it means. I find I can never read these words without emotion. He said this as they were getting ordained. He said, If other people knew you like God knows you, all your faults, all your vain thoughts, all your sins, all the things in your heart, all the wrong thoughts you ever had, would they trust you with the kind of work God trusts you with? Here is the supreme confidence that God has in his own grace. He'll take the like of you and me and give us the privilege of being his saints. The privilege of speaking for Jesus when we are as depraved as we are. And the question is, is that your treasure? When I was a kid, my dad used to bring uh, uh, an asterisk book back with him when, we were on, um, when he came back from business trips. And I'd get my asterisk book, and I would, it would be all I wanted for the next two hours. Is the gospel your treasure? Because we're not going to move forward unless I'm thrilled with it in my identity and unless I can see my sin. A few years ago, I was on my uh, day off uh, at home, and um, my brother and sister-in-law were going off to a wedding, and I was left to look after the kids with my parents. And I was, I was in the, um, uh, the, the living room of my parents' house, teaching my nephews, who were two and four, to scrummage, to play rugby. So we were down playing rugby. By the way, the Rugby World Cup starts next week, and that is an event, just so you know, superseded in importance only by the second coming of our Lord. Anyway, <laughs> I was on the ground, and I was, I was teaching this four-year-old to scrum, and as I was doing it, the two-year-old, Patrick, he picked up a large plant pot, and he started to empty soil all over my mother's lovely dining room, my mother's... Um, uh, 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 lounge floor, in order to make a field. And when I next looked up, I'm not kidding, there was mud all over the floor. And at that point, my mother walked in the room, and the floor was trashed. And she walked over to her two-year-old grandson. She picked up the plant pot. She put it on one side. She picked him up, and she kissed him, and she said, let's go and have lunch. And as she carried him across the floor, he looked over at the four-year-old and I on the ground, and he went like that. His grandmother knows what he's done. She's going to clear up the mess. She loves him anyway. Can I tell you, God's like that with you. He knows what you've done. He's cleared up the mess. He loves you anyway. He's given you the righteousness of Christ. How do you then want to live? It's amazing. With my mum, I just knew she'd have forgiven me anything, but it meant I longed to please her. But where are you on the grace of God? And that's where I stand. If I'm going to speak to others, I've got to have that in place. Secondly, as we look down, there's Gehenna. Here's a second G that's coming up. Uh, Jesus, again and again, ladies and gentlemen, spoke of a place called hell. Um, it's the Greek word that is, that is used uh, for the, the garbage dump. Fires were kept constantly burning outside Jerusalem in this, in this place called Gehenna. The bodies of criminals and animals were thrown there to burn. And as Jesus looked at the burning, he said, there is a place called Gehenna for those who have rejected me, for those who have rejected God. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? There is such a place as Gehenna. So as we come to communion today, at the heart of the Christian faith, we're being saved from hell. And I come from a non-Christian home. I don't say that easily. From hell through the cross, for heaven. And can I say, Jesus was the theologian of hell. 
He is the one who spoke about it again and again and again. Just leafing through Matthew's gospel, it is extraordinary how many times Jesus, the most loving man that ever lived, spoke of hell. He says, there is a place called Gehenna. So Matthew 5, verse 22, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Matthew 5, verse 29, if your right hand causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. Matthew 8, verse 12, Uh, as we look down, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of of teeth. There is only one Jesus. He spoke again and again of a place called hell. And what is hell like? It is a place of suffering and separation. It is a place of fire and darkness. And who goes there? Those who say, I can do what I like with the hands God has made, the eyes God has made, the feet God has made. I will make my own decisions. God says, I've made those things. How you treat me and others in my world is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And I've sent my son to die to rescue you so that you can relate through his performance, not mine. But if you ignore that, there is a place called hell. So um, I have a personal mission statement. This is what I put on top of my calendar each year. I got it from Frank Retief, a bishop down in Cape Town. He makes all his clergy have this on their calendars. This is how I organize my time. People without Christ go to hell. And I want to learn from Jews for Jesus, who have as their mission statement, let's make Jesus an unavoidable issue. Let's make him unavoidable. Um, I played rugby at Oxford University, and I was there with a guy called Ed. And I was at Theological College, and I gave Ed a tape of a sermon I preached, John 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Ed, one evening, got that tape out, and in the rugby house they were living in, he gave it to Dave and to Ben and to Chris, and they listened to it together the night before a game, a quiet night in. And as I was speaking, I said, either we pay for our sin ourselves in hell, or the Lamb of God pays. And Dave, who was captain of the Oxford side, got more and more angry, a non-Christian listening. And at the end of the sermon, he said to Ed, who'd played the tape, also a non-Christian, he said, Rico's not my friend. And they said, yes, he is. You play golf together, you play in the front row together, you room together on tour. He said, he's not my friend. He said, if that's what Rico believes, the fact he said nothing to me in 18 months means he does not care for me. And Ed, the non-Christian, then rang me up at my college and said, look, I'm really sorry, I played the tape to Dave. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't have done, but he's very cross. You haven't spoken to him. And what we're told here in this passage, can we look down, Romans, can we look down, Romans chapter one, have a look down. We're told that there is a debt. Verse 14, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and foolish. Now, there are two ways to fall into debt. One is that, Uh, Josh gives me $20 and I give it back to him. But the second is he said, here's $20 and would you pass it on to Lorianne? Now, until I pass this on, I am in Josh's debt and Lorianne's debt. And Paul says, I've got to go to Spain because I'm in their debt. And my brother, sister, you are in debt to those around you if you haven't warned them. You are in their debt. And what's amazing in England, I don't know what it's like in Nashville, but I'll tell you what they say in England. People say, my faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on someone else. But they're functional universalists. Dave was right to be furious. He said, if that's what you believe about hell, Rico, how have you not warned me? We're in debt. Now, as we look down again, why won't we speak, thirdly? Can we put the third? What's, what's the reason? If, if this is true, why am I not speaking about it? And, you know, before I speak to someone, I'll try and say, look, this, this friendship's so important. Please bear with me, but I, I'm in, I, I need to say this. But why won't we? Well, actually, time and again, verse 25 is the project problem, and this is glory. Can we see as we look down the bottom? Uh, we're nearly finished. Let's have a look. Verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie... And humanity worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who's forever praised. And that's not just the non-Christian. That's us too. Three weeks before the varsity match in in England, which is uh, played at a big stadium, and my parents were upset I was getting ordained. I was longing to play in that match for them. And I I, I remember three weeks 
before the game, whether we were going to, I was going to be selected or not. I wasn't selected. The other guy was better than me. But anyway, there we are. Um, I, I remember standing in the college chapel and thinking, I don't care about God. I don't care about the gospel. I don't care about people going to hell. I just want to get a blue to play Cambridge. Now, that's an idol. Rugby's a good thing, but it become a God thing. And we've got to diagnose them. Why aren't you speaking about the Lord Jesus? There are other things that are more important. So can I ask you, my brother, sister, here's a question to go away with. What do you daydream about? And what do you most fear? And those things are governing your heart. And that is very often why you're not speaking. And it can often be a good thing. The grandchildren, the job, the hobby, these are good things. They're given by God, but they become God things. As, as we go on this glory hunt, and then we come along on a Sunday, and we expect God to be some waiter that we tip on a Sunday, and then he'll grant us our, our dreams, rather than living for his glory, which is that people come to know him. That's at the heart of glorifying him. I remember when I started at All Souls, this church in central London. So I worked there with John Stott, who was a famous clergyman. He got up at 10 to 5 in the morning and slept for half an hour each afternoon. And I myself adopted one of those two habits. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 but there I was. And, and I, 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 I remember when I first started, my first 10 years at All Souls, I kept lying to people. And the reason I was lying was... My idol was to be seen as a fine Christian worker. And fine Christian workers were efficient, and I wasn't efficient. And therefore, if you asked me if I'd done something, I'd say I had, try and run off and do it before you found out I hadn't. Now, why was I doing it? It's because my righteousness was in pleasing people like John Stott. And I had to go, no, my righteousness is in the death of Jesus, who has died, and that's my identity. So then I started, once I saw that, going... I'm sorry, I haven't done it. I said I would. I've been inefficient. Please forgive me. I'll try and do it. That took me 10 years to get that. But it was an idol that was driving it. What are your daydreams? What are your nightmares? That's why you're not speaking. Let me close now. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth G here that we've got to get in place in terms of telling others. And you know, this is huge for my beloved church family back in London. I love them to bits, but this is so often we got what we get wrong. The fourth one is Godliness. And somehow, in our churches, we have a model of godliness that separates from evangelism. So we think we're being godly, but we never speak to people. We just don't do it, but we think we're being godly. You cannot be godly, you cannot be godly, and not be trying to speak to the lost. Because at the heart of being godly is being like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? For God so loved the world, he sent his son, he went to the lost. Brother, sister, please don't think you're being godly if you're not trying to speak to other people. It's at the heart of godliness. And what is it that makes God most angry? Let's have a look as we close. Verse 18. Can we see as we look down? The wrath of God, God's anger, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. What makes people most angry is he says, God says, I've sent my son to die. We're coming to communion today. I've sent him so that he'll pay in death and blood for your sin, and so you don't have to go to hell for your sin. It is that serious. And yet, you have people who say, I don't need Jesus to die for me, I'm fine as I am. Or you have people who say, I don't need to talk about this, it, it's fine as it is. We suppress that truth. I mean, I've got a son called Daniel. Say we were outside, and a truck was coming along out on the road outside, he saw it coming, you were in the way, he pushed you out the way as he ran across, got hit by the truck and killed, and then there's his dead body. You looked across and you said, he didn't need to do that, I was fine. When we know he died to save you. God says, I have sent my son to save you, and you suppress that truth, and there's nothing that makes me more angry. It's a huge thing. Do you know, there's a verse that, that has sat with me so often uh, when it comes to telling others and not suppressing this truth. Ezekiel 3.18. It was in Paul's mind as he wrote Romans. He said this, When I say to the wicked man, you'll surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him of his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I'll hold you accountable for his blood. 
We are accountable for our neighbours. We don't love them unless we warn them. Jesus died for a reason, so that they can find protection in his blood as we come to this communion. So of those four, can we stick them up on a slide now? I wonder which of those four you have to get in place. The grace of God. My identity's there. Whether I'm rejected or accepted, that's my security. Gehenna, there is a place called hell. Jesus died for a reason to save me from that. Sin is that serious. Glory, which idols cause me not to be speaking? Godliness, do you know I thought I could be godly and never speak about this? I can't. And then, and then my brothers and sisters, who do you need to warn? Who is the person? Maybe a couple of people. They're on your mind now. They're friends. They've been friends for years. But you've never spoken to them. You've never paid the debt. You've never said, look, you're a dear friend. I, I won't be your friend unless I warn you. Can I just tell you that I, I think Jesus rose from the dead. I think one day he'll say to you, do you know me? Have you been forgiven? Please, you know, bear with me as I say that. Can we look at this? There is a debt. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, thank you that we come to communion now and therefore we're forgiven. We are forgiven our sins of omission. Thank you that we are in Christ. We're safe. Thank you, Father, that you send your Holy Spirit before us and so he opens the way for us to speak. Thank you that you open blind eyes. But Father, as we think of those we need to speak to, we pray for them now. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us courage, give us a question to ask, and give us an opening that we may indeed warn them and that their blood would not be on our hands. Amen.